Before I begin this message, I want to mention that President Trump did ask uh, all of the faith community to make March 15th, this Sunday, a day of prayer. And so I'm encouraging all of us, whether you're watching online or live today, that we take time today to specifically pray for the nation. And there are six things that I am, am praying about individually, and I want to invite you to join with me on these same six points. And if we could go ahead and begin to put those up. The first thing I'm praying for is, is a swift end to this virus outbreak and protection for people. Amen? Amen, especially for those in the at-risk groups. Those are people with compromised immune systems, people who have uh, otherwise uh, other health issues like heart issues, high blood pressure, cancer, and people who are over 70. You know, I actually had to ask my mother-in-law not to come to church today. Uh, seriously, I, I said, Marilyn, I know we're asking people over 70 not to come to church, you know, for their health, and uh, we want to we want to protect the most at risk. And she's like, oh, okay. And I said, you know, are you sure, Reese? I said, well, you know, Marilyn, I would have let you come, but Pastor Pat, Pastor Pat said no. Uh, yeah, I threw you under the bus, Pat. Yeah, I, no, I didn't. But but that's important. But we want to pray for those people. We want to believe for safety for those people. There are tens of thousands of people all over the world in hospitals who have who have a serious case of this flu. And so we're praying for healing. I don't want to see 15% of those people pass or 5% or anything. I want to see those people healed, and I believe God can. And so that's what I want to stand in faith for, all right? Got somebody with me on that? Say amen. I want wisdom for our leaders in the decisions they have to make. You know, I was on a conference call with 500 other pastors and the governor uh, on Friday. There's another one coming up this Thursday. And, and I feel for Governor Polis. Pray for Governor Polis. I, 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 he's a businessman. I don't think he really is looking to close things down. I don't think there's much, there's much benefit to him, but he's got a very difficult situation to balance. I mean, he even said on, th on, on Friday, hey, go skiing. Then on Saturday, he closed all the ski resorts. And, and I, I don't think he wanted to, I think he, he kind of the medical community said, hey, you need to do that because of people coming into the state and all that. And so it's difficult. So please be praying for Governor Polis and the other leaders. I, I want us to pray for strength and protection for our health care providers. Yes. Amen. Some of you are in the room today. Some of you are watching online. If you are a, a nurse, if you're a respiratory therapist, if you're a custodian in a hospital, uh, you are on the front lines. If you're a doctor, a nurse practitioner, you, you literally are out there with all of this and it's around you and we want to pray for your health for your protection and and that's important and then there's a lot of people whose jobs are being impacted I, I had a church member tell me that uh, his his girlfriend had to take a 10% pay cut because the industry she's in is way down uh, one of our te uh, team members took went to Starbucks to pick up coffee for some of the volunteers this mor morning by the way thank you to Tamara and the others who disinfected all the doorknobs and things between services so thank you and so uh, we'll disinfect him again after the services, so we appreciate that. But there's a lot of people whose jobs are being impacted, and I'm just praying that God has a provision, because I know there's a provision for people. And finally, an end to the fear and panic. Really, and it, it, we don't need fear and panic. That's not helping anybody, and we, we but need to see it replaced with divine peace. You know, Jesus said this. He said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you. And so I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you'll help us all to rest in the grace that brings that peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, to begin this message, I, I, in case you haven't noticed, now the title is The Power of Family. But in case you haven't noticed, this has been a week for the record books. You know, I, this is a week of first. I never thought I'd have to ask my mother-in-law not to come to church. Never thought I'd ever have to do that. I, if you had told me in January that the entire nation would be in, in captivity and there would be a worldwide toilet paper shortage because, because of a bat virus, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, no, that's not possible. A bat virus? How can a bat virus bring about a worldwide toilet paper shortage? But it has. And, 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 and that's something that I want us to understand. It, it, it's brought about a worldwide toilet paper shortage because of the fear that has resulted in people's hearts. And as Pastor Aaron alluded to, this is not the first plague. This is not the first crisis. This is not the first difficult situation that we have ever faced as a people. And I have great faith 
in the American people. I'm just, I'm an American, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I think Americans are amazing. I think we're one of the most adaptable, overcoming group of people in the history of the world. I think we are going to rise to the occasion and we're going to help other nations overcome their issues. I'm a believer in that. But I want you to know that Jesus showed us that you can face crises and come out on pop, top. If you think about his life, I mean, imagine this man. They brought him impossible situations. They brought him dead people. They said, here is a dead person. What are you going to do with it? And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm going to speak life into this dead person. This dead person's rising up. This dead person's coming back. This dead person's going to live a long life and testify of the glories of God. Come on. Amen. I mean, they brought him people who had been sick for 20 years and who doctors had no hope for. People who had spent all of their money trying to get better, and yet there was no solution. But Jesus didn't see that as impossible. Jesus didn't look at this and say, I'm sorry, but we've not yet developed an antivirus uh, you know, inoculation for that. You're just going to have to wait. No, he spoke to that situation. He spoke in the authority of, of the father that he'd been given, and he healed those people. He healed those people. He wasn't overcome. Jesus was out on a boat and multiple times, and, and he's in a little tiny boat on a giant big lake, and the storms come, and the waves are there, and the guys on the boat are freaking out, and he is just mahalo in the whole thing. He looks at him, he says, Jews, chill, chill everybody. And then he looks out on the water, and he says, chill, water. Chills, I'm paraphrasing, if you would. <laughs> but he says, be at peace. And the waters came at peace because he was never afraid. He wasn't worried. These things, they were real. They were real issues. But they didn't throw him for a loop. If you'll allow me to... to take liberalities with the story. You remember when he was doing a week-long crusade and they ran out of food, right? His disciples came into him and said, Jesus, Jesus, we were just at Walmart and all the shelves were empty of bread. And Jesus didn't say, well, what we need to do is we need to call a week-long fast and then we'll all be better. He didn't do that. No, what he did is he took what little they had and he prayed and the little they had turned out to be more than enough. Amen. The little they had turned out to be more than enough. Sometimes we get into situations and we look at what we've got and we say, man, how can this little bit make a difference? How, how, I, don't, I just don't see how I have enough provision in my hands to meet this need. And in those are the moments when we need to step out like Christ did and say, Jesus, I, I trust you. You showed us the way. If we have a little, it's enough if we just put it into your hands because you'll multiply it. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about there ever being a toilet paper shortage during Jesus' times. Really, there's not a word about that anywhere in the Bible. But you want to know something? If there was a toilet paper shortage in Jesus' times, he would have prayed over the TP and it would have multiplied and there would have been more than enough for everybody who had. All right. And, and on a serious note, because seriously, this happened to one of our staff members and it's happened to some friends of mine. They just literally forgot to go to the grocery store three weeks ago and pick up toilet paper. And so they're completely out. Well, we as a church, we've got toilet paper at the information center. So if you need a few rolls to help your family during this time, just take a few rolls, please. And, and, and it, they're our gift to you, okay? Because there is more than enough toilet paper to go around. Hey, hey, Amen. God bless you all. All right. That actually is worth a clap. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> and so the question is, why was Jesus so unfazed by all of these situations, all these crises, all these shortages, all these diseases that he had to, to deal with and how to face? Well, the reason is because he was secure in the knowledge that he was a beloved son of God. And he understood what it meant to be a beloved son of God. And he knew the authority that had been given him as a beloved son of God. You remember the story that Jesus was being water baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And as he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, goes and rests on him. And then there's this voice from heaven that says, Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
Well, Jesus knew that before that voice ever spoke, but the rest of us didn't. It was for the the audience around him that that voice spoke because Jesus had, had, had heard the voice of God speaking to him as a young man, assuring him, assuring him that he was indeed a beloved child of God. And that's the security that we need to understand is ours. The Apostle Paul was writing to a, a young congregation, a, a, a brand new congregation. It was, it was the congregation of the Galatians. And in chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says this. It says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. So that, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, our our daddy, Father. Well, now you are no longer slaves, or you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. You're God's own child. Addison, you're God's own child. You may be Krista and Aaron's child, but you are God's own child. Amen? You are God's own child. And since you are his child... God has made you his heir. Now, Addison, you inherited your musical ability in large part from your grandfather and your father. They were both drummers and both musicians. But Addison, you have an even bigger inheritance that's available to you from your heavenly father, your Abba Daddy. You know, you have have stuff that he has wanted to bequest to you that you're not even aware of yet. You have incredible things in your future. Dude, I don't know why I'm saying this. I'm not picking on you. I feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to know you haven't even begun to tap in to the things that God has for you. You're just beginning to break in to the inheritance that God has for you. You have got the ability to write music. You don't know that. You have the ability to play other instruments. You don't know that. You have the ability to train people how to enter in the presence of God. You're just learning that. There are inheritances that God wants you to step into. And if you're watching online, you're saying, why are you spending your time with him? Because this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's ignoring you. If you listen, he'll give you a word for your life as well right now. Amen? But Addison, there are good things ahead in your life. Because you are a child of God. Now. It is my opinion, and I believe this is backed and supported by Scripture. That the reason we're seeing people in panic mode is what Aaron was alluding to about bowing the knee. It's because they don't know that they are children of God. Or if they do know they're children of God, they don't understand what that means to them. Or they only understand in part. And because they don't have a full revelation, when things like, like bat viruses rise up, they begin to panic because they don't appreciate that God has given us the solution in the position we hold as sons and daughters of God. They are essentially acting out of an orphan perspective or orphan spirit or orphan mindset. And what is an orphan, at least in the context of this discussion? An orphan is someone without father or family. Someone without father or family. Now, if you were a Jew in ancient Israel, if you were an orphan and you didn't have a father and you didn't have a family, you were cut off from an inheritance. You were cut off from a provision. You were cut off from protection. You were cut off. And so you were essentially a beggar who went around hoping that somebody, somebody would take care of you. You, know, you didn't have any place to sleep at night because there was no house for you to sleep in. You didn't have a, a field that was yours because your father hadn't passed it on to you so that you had to go and find other fields. You probably became a thief or you sold yourself into slavery. But you certainly didn't have an expectation or an anticipation of walking in prosperity or blessing or abundance because you were an orphan and the blessing came through the family. And if you'll extend that same thought to the spiritual realm, when we don't understand that we are sons and daughters of God, we go around living like we're without a father or family, and we cut ourselves off from the inherited blessing that God wants to give us. See, when you see yourself as a spiritual orphan, 
you'll spend your life thinking that you always have to provide for yourself. It's up to me if it's to be. Seriously, it's, I've got to do this. I've got to do this for myself. I mean, there's nobody else who's going to do this for myself. And guys, I believe in hard work. I'm a, I'm a champion of hard work. Isn't that right, Eliphaz? Yeah. <laughs> Eliphaz is my executive pastor. I mean, I, I believe that God calls for us to work hard. I'm not into just, you know, this four-hour work week. I don't even understand what that means. My belief is that God is glorified by what we do. But if I think that everything I need has to come from my own efforts, I am deceived because what I need in my life is impossible for me to produce on my own. But it's also unnecessary for me to produce it on my own because my heavenly father has adopted me into his family and he has gifted me with an inheritance that includes a provision for everything I need to not only take care of me, but to be a blessing for other people and to fulfill the destiny and the purpose that God has placed on my life. I'm not an orphan. Can, can I tell you something? Heaven is not shut down this week. Uh, heaven's not shut down. You know, my family were really, I, mean, I was really wanting to take time off this week at spring break with my kids and go skiing. Not happening because they've closed all the ski resorts. But heaven's not closed. You know, the Holy Spirit is not practicing social distancing. <laughs> all right, you know, I'm, I'm not against social distancing. I'm nice to see you all spread out this morning. This is very good. You know, it is. I and mean, I believe that's fine to be six feet of separation. But the Holy Spirit does not want six feet of separation. He wants to come graft himself into your life and, and, and become a part of your heart. And he wants you to know that he's family so you can hug him. You can, you can kiss him. You can hold hands with him. You can walk with him because you never have to separate yourself from him. And I may have been shocked that a bat flu was bringing the world to its knees, but this did not surprise God. God knew about this a long time ago, and he made a provision a long time ago. One of his names is Jehovah Jireh. It means the God who sees ahead and makes a provision. And, and, and you may not know you're going to need this, but he sets up a situation so that when you are walking and suddenly you're in a crisis, the provision of God has already been placed in your area and you can tap into it. You can harvest it. You can draw from it because you are his sons and daughters. And he is the God who saw ahead and made a provision for the bat flu. <laughs> Doesn't this sound like a bad B movie? The bat flu takes over the whole world. When you're an orphan, you don't trust people. You don't. You don't trust people. Because they're not family. They're the competition. They're the competition. I, I, I can't trust you because you, you're trying to take away my stuff. You're trying to take away my joy. You're trying to take away my sense of who I am. You're trying to take, I mean, the pie is only so big. And so if, I, if you come in and take a little of my pie, you know, I'm going to smack you right in the throat. I'm going to throat punch you because I, you're my competition. But when you're a son of God, you recognize that you have a trust fund with an unlimited balance. You have a trust fund with an unlimited balance. You don't have a green card. You don't have a gold card. You don't have a platinum card, a plum card, or a black card. You got a card. You guys even know what I'm talking about there? Is anybody even following that? Thank you, all you American Express fans. You know, the point of this is that you have a card with an unlimited balance. And so you can draw peace and you can draw protection, and you can draw provision, and you can draw on what you need because I do not have to be afraid of you. I can have a relationship with you. I, I, in fact, I can be generous towards you. I can be merciful towards you. I, I, can, I can even share what I have with you because I'm not worried about my trust fund drying up because I'm a child of God and I have an inheritance from a limitless Father in heaven. So I can adapt. Hey, you want me to stay home and work from home? I can work from home. You want me not to go skiing? I don't have to go skiing. You, 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 you want us to meet in groups of less than 250? Mahalo, not a problem. We can handle that. You know, you, you want me not to kiss my wife? Okay, now we're talking. So, all right. Now we got an issue. I, that, that, there are things that I'm not going to do. But, but the point of it is that I'm not worried about those things because I'm a son 
not an orphan. And I know there's a provision. I don't have to hoard. Seriously, I don't have to hoard. I can share. My neighbor forgets to go to the grocery store. I can pick some of my groceries, share some of my pasta, you know, take some of my rice, take some of the cases of beans I got, whatever. Put it in a box and go share it with them. I can do that. Because I got more than enough. I got more than enough. In fact, most of us have never even tapped into the things that we have. Now, many of you have heard the story how my father started a business when I was about seven years old, and, and I, it was 1970, and the first three to five years were really difficult. I mean, the first three years, we made $3,300, his first three years total, 70, 71 and 72. That's not much money, okay? I mean, we, we, were, we were poor. Got a little better in you know, the fourth year, a little better in the fifth year. By the sixth year, we were doing okay. By the time I got to high school, turned 16 and got my driver's license, my dad's business was doing well. We weren't wealthy, but, but we were prospering. We were thriving. And he had, you know, he had about six trucks and vehicles in the company. And all of those trucks and vehicles were parked at our house because his business at that time was in our basement. And there was a key rack with all of the keys to all of the vehicles. And when I turned 16, my dad did not buy me a car. What he said was, son, any car I have, you can drive. If there is a key hanging from the rack, and it's Friday night, and you want to go out with your friends, just take one of my vehicles, drive it, bring it back in the same condition at which you took it, <laughs> bring it back washed, bring it back full of gas, no scratches, no dents, none of that stuff. But, but I, you are my son. I trust you. Actually, he didn't trust me, but he was generous with me anyway. But he did trust me. He said, any of my cars you can have. You can have. You can have. You can drive those. And in a similar way, God has made the provision of heaven available to us. And he said, Pat, he said, Eliphaz, he said, Richard, he said, Tanya, you know, he, he, all of us. He looked at us and said, hey, take something off the key rack. It's yours. Take it outside. Push the button. Let it start. Now, can I tell on myself? First service, I said, put it in the ignition and turned it. And I realized I was dating myself because <laughs> you don't turn ignitions anymore. The, the point of that is that God has provision for you because you are his son or daughter. And he's just waiting for you to take it, go out and use it, and be a blessing to people. Be a blessing to people. He's given us the name of Jesus. He said, go out and pray. Anything you ask in my name, I'll do for you. You got a neighbor who's sick, you can't go in the house, stand on the street outside and say, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing. Better yet, pick up your cell phone, call them, tell them to go to the window and say, look out at me. Hey, in the name of Jesus, I am praying for you and I am cursing the whatever bat virus or whatever you got and I'm calling down healing from heaven. I mean, God has given us those keys. Let's go out and unlock some things. Let's go out and turn some things on. Let's go out and run over some things, huh? Let, let's go be monster trucks running over all of the works of the enemy. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Those are things that have been given to us. When we're orphans, we get insecure. We get insecure. Actually, you don't have to be an orphan to be insecure, but, but when you have an orphan mentality, you don't know that you're a child of God. So you get obsessed with what others think. And so when you get obsessed with what other people think, then you worry about what you're dressed like. By the way, how do I look today? Sarah said I look good, so is this all right? Got my preaching tinnies on, got these on. That's all impressive. <laughs> You know, the, the point of this is, though, but you get um, obsessed with, with dressing right, driving right, uh, but you never feel right because no matter what you change on the outside, you're plagued with feelings of inadequacy on the inside. Doesn't matter. And so what happens in times like these, if your whole self-image is who you work for, or how much money you make, or, or the business you built. And, and what if something should happen and that business has to close, or that company has to lay some people off, or, or maybe you can't afford the payments and all the stuff you have, so you got to turn some of that stuff back in. You're devastated. You're shocked. You know, you, you're crushed. But ladies and gentlemen, what could you possibly possess that would make you more important than being a child of the Most High God. Now, I grew up in, in southern Missouri, right north of northwest Arkansas, where Walmart was founded. And the 32nd Walmart in the whole country was in my hometown. Would that I had bought stock. 
I, I, I did just, I wasn't saved. I wasn't prophetic. Ed. That's a would be, could be, should be. But, but it became a kind of a joke in my high school that as you watched Walmart explode and the Walton family prosper and become wealthy and their kids prosper and their grandkids prosper, we kept thinking, hey, what would it be like to marry one of the Waltons? What would it be like to marry into the Walmart fortune? And ladies and gentlemen, the real truth is that what could you possibly inherit from the Waltons that is more prosperous or blessed or, or, or precious than what you inherit as a child of God? The answer is nothing. So quit trying to become what you already are. Come on, seriously. And if something happens, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my watch anymore. What happens? It means that I'm still a child of God. I'm going through a tough season. Well, okay, but God saw ahead that a provision's coming. And what the enemy intended for evil, God is going to turn around and work it to good. You know, you may try to curse me, but you cannot curse me because I'm blessed by God. And so if you take something from me, I am confident that my father, my father, my father, my family is going to multiply it back into my life abundantly above and beyond what I could imagine and certainly what you were expecting. You see, we have an adversary. And he has nothing on his heart except to steal from you, to hurt you, to rob from you, and to take your joy and your peace. He wants to leave you anxious and fearful and freaking out in this moment. And some Christians are buying into the lie that this whole virus is God's judgment on their actions. I literally talked to two people this week who said, I know this is happening to me because of how I've been living my life. And I said, brother, it's got nothing to do with how you've been living your life. Now, I don't advocate wrong living. Wrong living will bring about its own consequences, but, but you are not being tortured by the bat flu because of how you messed up. Do you honestly think I would punish my children when I see them making a mistake? D doesn't your heart break as a, as a parent for your, the, the failures of your kids when you see them stumble and fall? Do you want to kick them while they're down? No, you want to get down in the dirt with them and hold them and cry with them and wipe their tears and say, look, I know that you made a mistake. You need to know you made a mistake, but I know this mistake is not the end of my destiny or your destiny or my heart for you. And if you're willing to let me help you, I'll pick you up and I'll wipe off your tears and I'll clean off your dirt and I'll show you where you went wrong and I'll show you the right way. That's the heart of our Father towards His children. And that's what we can rest in. But a lot of people have forgotten what it means to be a child of God. And even more tragic in our generation, very few people even know that they can become children of God simply by reaching out and saying, Father, would you adopt me? You're watching online. I don't know if you're a regular attender or just somebody who's tuned in because you, you thought it might be interesting today. I don't know where you're at with God. I don't know what your relationship with God is. I, I, I'm going to assume that you believe that a God is at least possible, but what I want you to know is God wants you to know that he wants to become your father. He wants to adopt you into his family. He wants to give you an inheritance that will bring peace to your heart and peace to your circumstances and peace to your situations. So when things like this virus rise up, because things like this virus are going to come again, recessions are going to come again, the stock market is going to tank again, you know, there's going to be something new. But the next time it happens, he doesn't want you out there like an orphan. He wants you to understand the power of family. And he's inviting you to come into his. I'm inviting you to come be a part of ours, to, to watch us online. And when the day comes that we can open up the doors and have everybody here, thank you, everyone who stayed home today. You, you, you did what you should do. Those of you who are over 70, those of you who are you know, compromised immune, I'm proud of you. You did what you should do. Plan to do it next week, unless something changed. Just plan to stay home next week as well. But right now, I want to pray for every one of you who would like to become a child of God. Or maybe 
Maybe you know you're a child of God, but you forgot that that comes with inheritance. You forgot about the keys that are hanging on the rack. You forgot about the things that God said were yours. So if you in this sanctuary would just close your eyes and bow your heads, and you who are watching online, if you would just join with me, and if I could have some, some music. Thank you, Tanya. My first question is just for the people who are live with me today with no one looking around. If you've never asked God to adopt you as his child, if you've never asked him to, to become a child of God, to, to join him and his family, would you just slip your hands up and say, that's me, Pastor Reese. We had people in the first service who did that. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, I appreciate that. That's so good, that's so good. You can put your hands down. I want you to know in just a second, your life's gonna change for the better forever. Those of you who raise your hand, those of you who are raising your hands online, your life's about to change for the better forever. Because if you're a child of God, everything becomes different. You're no longer an orphan. You're not on your own. Let's pray. Say this, dear Father, everybody to get in this room, say, dear Father, adopt me. I want to be your son or daughter. I want to be part of your family. I receive the inheritance, the inheritance of peace, the inheritance of power, the inheritance of protection. I receive these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me. Those of you who, who have ever prayed the prayer in your life or those of you who just prayed it for the first time, there's some promises I want to remind you of that apply to the children of God. And they were written down in the book of Psalms, chapter 91. If we could post those up. I just want to read a few of these things to just assure you as we bring this service to an end. It says this, that those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about my Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. I trust him. You can say that with confidence now. He is your God. You can trust him. You can, you can find shelter. It says that he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. You, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. I appreciate Puracell. We got gallons of it out in the hallway. I appreciate Clorox wipes, but you know something? A more sure armor is knowing that he is my father. So I am not afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. I don't dread the disease that stalks the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. That is the inheritance of the sons and daughters of God. If you need uh, prayer for any situation you're in, we're going to have some ministers available at the end of the service. They'll touch you with their elbows. <laughs> Apparently, we're in the chicken wing mode of, of, of intercounter, but we love you. Uh, we encourage you to stay tuned uh, on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page. We'll be sharing updates. We look forward to connecting with you again next week. We love you all. Go with God.